Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road, where my guests today include volleyball professional player extraordinaire, indoor, outdoor, and recently the USA national champion, Sir William Robbins. Thanks, you, Mitch, for having me. Thanks for being here, William. I love the Empowered Sports Academy and everything you're doing there and how it affects my girls. It's just been great. Thank you. Uh, the one, the only, the one who boosts all of our ratings, the founder of the Yule Wilson Center, <laughs> Shirley Woods. Shirley, thank you for being here today. Love being here. Uh, we get fan mail all the time about your insights and just want to thank you for being so Holy Spirit led. You've given some of the most powerful talks I've ever heard in my life. You're, you're an amazing woman. It's and true. you tell Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it good. My good friend, the bishop, uh, former senior pastor of Blackhawk for many, many years, and we did life together there for a while, and now leadership development at Sweetwater, and you're leading the Global Leadership Summit here in Fort Wayne. We were the largest satellite uh, attendance-wise uh, with 2,500 people at the Grand Wayne Center. It was just awesome. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, it's great. Great to be with you as always and good to be with these two again. I want to toss out today's topic to you. It seems that everyone wants to be heard, forgiven, loved, and understood. But the irony is that few want to listen, <laughs> forgive, love the unlovely, or take time to understand. How do you see that in your lives? whether it's marriage, business, uh, vocational ministry? I think you see it in all, all, all the above, um, absolutely. And I know, I know especially when you're dealing with leaders of any kind, leaders of any shape or size, men, women, doesn't really matter. Anybody who's leading anything, that personality, that DNA, they typically want to, we typically want to speak. We want to talk. We want to have impact. We want, does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. We just want to just go, go. Yeah. So much go. knowledge and wisdom. We just so we much just need to share. With Everybody the world. needs to hear. And so, yeah, no, I, I've seen it be a huge flaw in me at times over the years, but uh, it's just a, yeah, it's a, it's a principle that, that I think many of us would do well to give some thought to. Well, what's Ashley's quote she found? It was basically just kind of a funny little quote that talked about, you know, I apologize for constantly interrupting. It's just what I have to say is so much more important. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a little thing that her and I go back and forth with because, you know, it's, yeah, it, we, you know, I'm naturally, I'm a recovering, you know, talkaholic. And, um, you know, with the roles that I've had, I have to talk a lot and do a lot of explaining, a lot of teaching. Um, and then when I travel and share my testimony. Um, but, you know, it, it does. It takes a lot of wisdom as a leader to try to figure out that balance of when to speak and, and pour out that knowledge and wisdom and when just, just to listen mm -hmm. and be able to hear a person's heart and be able to hear the, the whole situation. Yeah. So that way you can really let the spirit work in the situation and be able to you know, understand it fully to be able to make some decisions and maybe be able to help the situation. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I've struggled. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley, how about you? Uh, the art of listening is a is a subject and a principle that we all need. Um, listening encourages you to hear the other person. And as I was share sharing earlier, I, I remember having discussions with my husband over topic, the same topic over and over and over again. And um, there was just one time he repeated himself again, and I actually listened, but I wasn't listening to his words. I listened to his heart, and it actually changed me. Wow. In my perspective, in our relationship. Mm -hmm. So listening is so valuable. Uh, that's why he said, talk little, listen much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a reason for that. I was just thinking the same thing. I, the last year entering into a whole new arena for me, actually having the privilege of doing a lot of CEO or C-suite level coaching and leadership development work with individuals who are, you know, leading in this arena or that. Um, 
one of the one of the most profound lessons that I've seen some of these individuals learn is just that biblical principle of be slow to speak, quick to listen. Uh, it doesn't sound like complicated, high-level leadership jargon, but man, you start talking to people who are leading big things, for-profit or not-for-profit, uh, you start talking with them about those principles of slow yeah. to speak, quick to listen, yeah. slow to anger. There's a biblical proverb right there that's just making a huge difference. James 1, 19, the very first verse I made Megan memorize. Oh, yeah. My oldest daughter, <laughs> yep. So that probably tips off what the issues were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it is amazing. Um, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, probably 20,000 people listening on the mountainside, uh, gives these words. It's uh, Matthew 7, 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Uh, Jesus is the first to make that statement in a positive light. And here's what I mean by that. Sages said, don't do to others what you don't want others to do to you. And so that can be kind of a passive, fly under the radar, wouldn't really have to interact with anybody to do that. But Jesus makes it active, intentional. Um, it requires that I listen, forgive, <laughs> love the unlovely, uh, seek to understand, take time to do that uh, for a greater purpose. How could applying that, being proactive about listening, forgiving, loving, understanding, how could that change your world? Well, I, I, I know for a fact after 28 years of, of marriage, it could change your marriage. I know that. I know that, you know, I, I understand there's truth here for women in this <laughs> discussion we're having, but, you know, let's be honest. The truth is what you just said. Uh, men need to hear that. Men need to apply this. Men need to think this through. Jesus' words right there are this blueprint for the one thing that men so often lack, which is initiative, which is action, which is not sitting in the, you know, in the chair, but actually getting up and doing something to, to pursue the wife, the, the teenager, the difficult person at work. I mean, men just need help and men need, you know, encouragement on this uh, doing. They do. Yeah, the doing. And all the others. women say, <laughs> <laughs> amen. Shirley, isn't it important to a woman that a man takes initiative? It is. It, it really is um, because I believe that that's what God intended. It's just designed. It, exactly. And then it creates the environment of the woman following her husband when she can see certain things in her husband. Him taking the initiative is actually teaching his wife, yeah. guiding his wife. And so it started with a man. And I just believe that any wise woman, if when she watches her husband uh, react or take initiative, it's a teaching tool for her too. Yeah, that's good. I think of a real simple thing between Susan and me. Uh, we tend to be late or barely right on time if we're ever traveling together. <laughs> and uh, I've only I've traveled millions of miles and I've only missed two planes. One was weather outside of my control, and the other one I just missed the announcement. <laughs> it was a weird thing. Um, it was a Miami airport. We've been there. It was, it was in the old part. And it was really weird. Like you couldn't hear the announcement. I'm standing right there ready to go. And I figured something was going on. Anyway. You missed uh, the plane, Mitch. We might miss the plane. <laughs> so anyway, um, I asked her one day. <laughs> I said, hey, Susan, um, why aren't you ready to leave like when I think we should be ready to leave? She goes, you're standing around and I think we got a lot more time. <laughs> I go, you really are interpreting that the fact that I'm like <laughs> hanging around means we got some more time? She goes, yeah, I think I let my guard down and the time starts passing by. So we got this little deal now. I'll go, I'm going to the car. <laughs> <laughs> See, then I go to the car and when she gets in, 
There's like, why weren't you doing this? You could have been doing this, this, and this oh, while, yeah. you were, while you were waiting. Yeah, I've been told she, that too. And she's right. Yep, that's true. <laughs> she did six Go or seven things that I could have taken the initiative to do that would have made oh. us earlier. You guys are learning. We, we are learning. learning. We are, we are learning. <laughs> All our wives will be thanking you. You'll be yes. getting fan mail from our wives here soon now, too. Uh, Jesus, um, his words here in Matthew 7, 12, were called the golden rule because an emperor later inscribed it in uh, on the palace wall in gold. And it absolutely requires initiative. Um, we absolutely have to uh, take time and make an initiative first to connect with God, I think, before we're ever going to connect with others. And uh, it's, it's God who allows us through his Holy Spirit to actually make a heart connection with someone. My dad used to say, don't listen to the words he's saying, listen to what he's really telling you, <laughs> you know? And that's what you just said, you know, you listen to the heart, to the desires, to the motives. Um, Susan and I were trying to figure out whether my next move should be to uh, volunteer full-time with you at Blackhawk. And uh, Bill Muir, the movie maker, uh, spent about a day and a half with us. And he was walking us through it, walking me through it mainly, and then he put us together. And he listened to us talk for about probably three or four minutes at the most. And he said, uh, time out. He said, why do you both speak as if you're miles away when you're only inches apart? And what he was saying was not just the proximity, of where we were sitting, but he meant that we were saying the exact same thing. I found a lot of times that in any kind of argument, we're saying the exact same thing. We have the same desires. We want the best for our kids. We want the best for our marriage. You know, we want to be pursued. We want, guys want to be respected. The woman wants to be respected. Everybody wants to be loved. You know, all that's going on. And it's almost always the same exact thing. It's just a little bit different way of saying it, or a little bit different position. Um, so I've, I've never forgotten that, but I suppose I do forget it in the heat of a discussion, a polite <laughs> discussion, you know, where that might be happening. But anyway, uh, due he, to heated others, fellowship, in heated, heated fellowship, fellowship. Is what Shirley called it. Yeah. Yeah. Heated fellowship. That's a great <laughs> word. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it sound so much better. So, <laughs> so much more civil. Hashtag heated fellowship. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a fight. It's just heated fellowship. Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's very That's good. That's awesome. Uh, but the golden rule requires that we take initiative. So, Kelly, can you talk about how you've seen where taking initiative to listen makes a big difference? We laugh at, you know, Ashley's T-shirt or the quote that she found, you know, pardon me for all my interruptions, but what I've got to say is just so important. I mean, that's, we laugh at that, but... Uh, we do. I mean, I know in the consulting world, yeah. I know in the, in the leadership world, uh, I know even all those years being a pastor, and I think we can all relate with this at some level, there, there's just this part of it's our job. You know, we, we get paid to lead, to, to say stuff, to, to offer, to invest in it. So I know I was talking with, um, I had a chance through my Willow Creek Global Leadership Summit experiences, I had a chance to talk with Henry Cloud uh, last spring. And Henry was just relaying to me. He knew I was heading into the consulting field, and he was just relaying to me about some of the ways in which he enters into relationships with, you know, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies who are paying him enormous amounts, you know, by the hour. That and, little book he wrote, uh, Boundaries, only sold like five million copies, I think. Yeah. That's with John it. Townsend. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> anyway, he was just telling me that literally the first couple of meetings, you know, the first... You know, the first hour, and then he comes back the next month, the second hour, he doesn't say anything. That I mean, he literally just asks a few questions and gets that guy or gal talking so he can learn. He just takes notes for an hour and doesn't offer any advice. The coaching doesn't begin. The strategy's not laid out. Um, and oftentimes those individuals are looking at him like, wait, what's going on? I thought we were going to, you know, and then, you know, he gets there. But it was a great reminder to me um, of what, Stephen Covey said, gosh, was 30 years ago? I don't know when Seven Habits came out, but I remember being a young guy reading for the first time, seek to understand before being understood. And I remember being, you know, 20-something going, wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's changing. That's like the ball game right there. Exactly. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I just think in every arena that, uh, that, that willingness 
to gain perspective, listen, ask questions, is just huge. I think we need to first connect with God who allows us to connect with others, you know, and it's his Holy Spirit in us that helps us. I don't think left to ourselves will ever do it. I, I think it's the Holy Spirit in us helps us listen, um, forgive, love the unlovely, take time to seek to understand. Um, it's interesting that Proverbs 18, 13 says, he who answers before listening is to his folly and shame. Yeah. Can you think of a time where answering before listening didn't work out so well? <laughs> yeah, well I, Besides fast food drive through <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know that any one, one incident stands out, but I think too many times you think you know the direction the person is going with the conversation or what they're about to allude to or... Uh, you know, the point of all of it. And so you're quick to jump in. And a lot of times, sometimes it's because we're rushed. You know, we got a lot of things to do and we just want to hurry up and men, naturally, we just want to fix the problem and move on. Um, and so, you know, it, you don't hear the heart of the person. You don't hear uh, really all of the facts. And so, yeah, you're quick to just throw out a, a solution. And you, sometimes you make yourself to look like a, a real fool because it's completely off base with where they were even going with it. Um, but then, too, you know how some, you know, it's just it's human nature. We want to be heard. We want the person to at least hear us out and to be able to really understand our perspective and our standpoint. Um, and then, you know, then let them give us the advice. But, yeah, if someone just jumps in and just gives you advice and you haven't really kind of, you know, you know, felt like they've heard you out, then yeah, you're not going to listen to them. Yeah. You're not if, gonna... if I walk into Kelly's office and ask for advice and I haven't told him everything and I know I haven't told him everything, he gives me advice, I'm automatically discounting it because he doesn't know what I haven't told him. Uh, it's like that picture. Remember that picture, Kelly? I think uh, you might have used it in a sermon where uh, two groups were building a, a bridge to connect in the middle, and they end up like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, somebody wasn't listening. <laughs> what an amazing picture yeah. of that, though. And that's the same in business and marriage and vocational ministry. Yeah, um, We need to uh, ask questions. We need to humbly ask questions, listen. Uh, and then that's the only way we'll ever know how to serve somebody, to do for them what uh, they actually would want us to do for them. We, it's based on their needs uh, in Christ, not based on what I want to do yeah. you know, to them. Um, I think this is really interesting. Um, Jesus described loving God and loving others as the greatest commandment, right? Paul said that the entire law was summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And he taught the Romans that love fulfilled the law, that loving your neighbor as yourself fulfills the law. And then Jesus' half-brother, James, said the same thing. It's all summed up in loving others. So uh, asking, humbly asking questions, listening, uh, forgiving, loving the unlovely, taking time to understand. If we, <laughs> I just almost chuckle because I know when we leave here today, it's going to be so hard to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we want it done to us, but we won't, we won't do it to others. Uh, but what's, go ahead, Sean. Well, I was just uh, reminded of a, a time when, when the Holy Spirit shared with me was that uh, loving somebody who can love you back is not really the issue. Mm. We, we, you know, it's easy to love you if you love me. But the real test of do I really walk in love is do you love your enemy? Mm -hmm. That's when you really know if you're walking in the God kind of love. Yeah. Loving those who's very oppositional, uh, you, it's always confrontational, and even sometimes backstab you. Yeah. That's the test. Are you really walking in love when you can feed them? Just a few minutes before Jesus said this, he said that. He said uh, anybody, even the tax collectors and uh, uh, prostitutes, you know, or the mafia, they love those who love them. I'm asking you to be complete or perfect or holistic or merciful to everybody right. uh, with your love. And it's, that's, great, that's powerful, Shirley. Um, I think what happens, though, is when we love others, we're loving them into God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. So as we go to God and he allows us to connect with others by forgiving, listening, understanding, loving, mm 
then he's going to connect them with God. Yeah. That happens probably scores of times uh, at the old Wilson Center. I, I term it, and I'm not using profanity, but uh -oh. I call it loving the hell out of them. No, that's true. <laughs> that's, good. that's true. You know, that's, that's, that's what we're doing, you know, yep. with the, the un, those that challenge you or those who are not even I think we should make saved. that a t-shirt. You know, <laughs> that would be good. Is, is to, to do that. You know, <laughs> there you go. that's what we want to do. Wow. And we want to love heaven into them. That's good. God's spirit into them. And love, I just believe love is the most essential part of the Christian faith. You know, that's what motivated God to do what he did when yeah. he sent his son was love. That's good. And yeah. so if if we as believers don't get that principle about love, we're going to miss Christianity. Yeah. You got to have that. He only left us three things to do. Love him, love yourself, love your neighbors. That's it. Yeah. And if we can master that, yeah, it can be challenging. It can be hard, but it's doable if we let the Holy Spirit do it through us. Kelly, you want to lead us in a closing prayer and we'll have an offering, <laughs> maybe an altar call too. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my goodness. That's exactly it. Yeah, that is absolutely it. There's no question. Uh, I think what you said is really similar to what Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. You know that Peter saw this taught and modeled by Jesus. So I think what we want to try to do is uh, let's memorize the golden rule. And let's think about the initiative uh, part of it. Uh, take the initiative to humbly ask questions, listen, forgive, love, uh, attempt to understand. Um, in essence, we're going to be thermostats, not thermometers. We're going to first listen to our audience, and then we can set the temperature only because we've been touched by the programmer's hand. And that changes everything around us. I mean, that's, that would be a leadership lesson. Yeah. Do you remember the story in Seven Habits that Covey led with on that mm -hmm. seeking to understand before being, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. He gets on the subway on an early Sunday morning, nobody around, he's got his coffee, gets into the subway car, and at the next stop, a guy walks on with his kids. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. And the kids are going nuts. Kids are running around, jumping on the seats, bedlam, causing problems. And the dad's just sitting there, not doing a thing. And it irritates Covey. And finally, he's had enough. Two or three stops later, he just walks over to the guy and says, I don't know what you're doing, but would you mind getting control of your kids? And the guy just looks up at Covey and says, I'm sorry. We just came from the hospital where their mom just died. Wow. And I don't think they know how to handle it. Oh my word. <sighs> and he just said it was just a seminal moment in his life of just this principle of being slow to speak, yeah. slow to anger, yeah. quick to listen. But he hadn't even, you know, contemplated yeah. asking any questions or trying to in any way decipher or understand this guy's situation. Wow. That is so powerful. Yeah. I think about how surely uh, what she said about uh, loving the unlovely and what you just said gives it the circumstances that they're probably coming from mm -hmm. and why we have to take time yeah. uh, to listen. I've, I've put together four simple questions that you can ask to connect with the heart of someone who might be on the outside looking in in terms of Christ. Mm -hmm. The first one, and I've never had anybody push back on these things. I, I've just simply asked, what's your church or spiritual background? Mm -hmm. Almost anybody will answer that. Mm -hmm. It's no big deal. Um, I've asked, will you please tell me your story? Usually after that. And almost everybody will just start talking. You know, you're not asking for A, B, C, then D. You, they just start telling you their story. And then I think this is really unthreatening. Uh, when they've told their story, you just say, where is God and all that for you? Where is God and all that for you? And it's, you can just almost see on their faces a perspective change. They almost look upward. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. And then they'll 
start telling you, well, I don't think he was there when this happened to me. And, and it, it just opens the door. But again, they're just talking. You're, yeah. you're just listening. And then I think this is a penetrating question. In terms of the God thing, would you describe yourself as skeptic, seeker, or surrendered? I've had so many people tell me they were different than what I would have assumed they were. Yeah. Oh, I'm really a skeptic, and I thought they were going to say seeker. Yeah. Um, it's really, really interesting, and I, I think those are so unthreatening. I know you've used questions well, like used, that. I've used. Uh, is the third question about where's God and all that? Yeah. Yeah. It's shocking to me. Everybody is able to answer that. They are. They, then you think they're not going to be able to. You think they've never thought of that. Everybody has thought of that. And everybody's able at some level to give you an answer to that one, which just opens up huge doors. You know, those questions are so laced with wisdom. Yeah. I, I love those questions. They're non-threatening. It really, to me, it opens up the heart of the hearer. Yep. It, it causes them to think without feeling you're questioning them. Right. It's just making them think. It's just, it's, to me, it's just really laced. With well, I really appreciate that. Kelly gave me the final question um, because they'll start warming to God uh -huh. and then when you feel the Holy Spirit prompting you, you would just say, hey, have you ever drawn a line in the stand, put a stake in the ground, and surrendered your life to Christ as Savior and Lord? Mm -hmm. And uh, it is so unthreatening. And you'll have people that have been in church their whole lives, and they'll say no. Yeah. It's incredible. And then I, I just, I've tried to uh, craft a simple prayer for somebody who might be on the outside looking in, and it's uh, saying to God, I can't, you can. Mm -hmm. um, I can't free myself from the penalty of sin, God in Christ, you can. I can't free myself from the power of sin, God in Christ, you can. I, I surrender my life to you as Savior and Lord. I remember one time talking about this, teaching on this at Blackhawk, and a Northrop High School senior came forward and asked if she could surrender her life to Christ. So it's just so interesting when you take the initiative and you do to others what you would have them do to you, when you take the initiative to ask questions humbly, listen, connect with the God of the universe first, allow His Holy Spirit to help you uh, forgive, understand, love the unlovely on how He actually, the purpose of this is that He will connect them yeah. with God. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us today.